power on through. A lot of information in a little bit of time. Um, so good morning. Um, my name is Elaine Porcher and I'm here with the lovely Erica Petrelli. Um, and we're here today to talk about transformative SEL or transformative social emotional learning. And a lot of us know the term SEL, know the term um, social emotional learning, but what we're gonna talk about today is the transformative part of that. Where do our identities intersect and how do we speak to those identities when we're talking about students and ourselves? So today will be kind of different in that we're gonna be talking about um, SEL as it relates to our kids, but we're also gonna be talking about SEL as it relates to us also. It's important to be able to see how our SEL or how our social emotional learning um, corresponds with our own selves so that we can then see how it corresponds to our students. So um, just buckle up because we're gonna look at, at what that's gonna feel like for ourselves and then how we can project that or how we can observe that in our kids. So the best way to engage is to have your cameras on and if not, that's okay too. Um, but know that if you stay muted, that will be helpful. Um, and, but if you have a concept that you'd like to talk about, um, please, uh, unmute yourself and just ask. We, we would love that. The more engagement, the better. It's great to know that you're there. And for a lot of you folks who are facilitating virtually, you kind of understand uh, this virtual realm in are people there or not? So um, you can totally just unmute yourself. Um, also the chat box is open. So please feel free to put as much as you like into the chat. Another way to engage is to make sure that you have a pen and paper handy. Even if you write down notes today and you crumble them up and you throw them away, your brain is going to retain a lot of that information just from the act of writing it down. So I would recommend that you write down fun, interesting ideas that come up, thought provoking ideas, um, things you didn't know about before. Maybe someone says something interesting, you're not quite sure what you're gonna do with that information or not, but just write that down because it helps to spark bigger ideas on how you're going to use this in the classroom down the line. So um, just um, some a, a little thought about just how to engage fully uh, to benefit you in the end. Thanks, Elaine. And good morning again, everyone. So again, my name is Erica. Elaine and I are so excited about this. Um, this is um, essentially designed as a three pack. So hopefully you've seen that the next few workshops um, are, are a continuation of a theme. Now, if you, eat, if you don't attend all three, each one of these stands alone with really amazing content. But we designed a series of three, like Elaine said, around this transformative look at SEL where we first today turn the mirror straight to ourselves and look at our own social and emotional leadership. Um, next session on Tuesday is really the transformative lens of, from an educator perspective. How are we using some guiding questions to set up our classroom and then expanding to our school communities? So we hope you attend all three in this series. Um, but today, like Elaine said, we really want to make sure we're paying atten attention to SEL as relates to our individual leadership. Why? Well, this quote on the board right now um, is a pretty good reason why. Some of you may have seen this statistic before, which is from the Center for Creative Leadership. It says that 75% of careers are derailed for reasons related to emotional competencies, including the inability to handle interpersonal problems, unsatisfactory team leadership um, during times of difficulty or conflict or inability to adapt to change. So certainly in the last year, we've all been put to the test with that. Um, and the idea is that whether you've had attended workshops on SEL this year or not, um, chances are, historically speaking, our SEL workshops and trainings are geared towards how are we uh, training our students in this. But this statistic reminds us that we need to be training ourselves and thinking about our own leadership and our own approach to our classrooms, our communities, um, when it comes to SEL. So this is a stark reminder that our leadership depends on this work. 
So if you had workshops with us or others this year on SEL, we remind you to approach today with a learner beginner's mind, even if you're feeling like you've had this information before. And if it's new information, soak it up with the understanding that this stuff um, accounts for a lot of our success in our workplace. But before we dig into the, the meat of the content, we wanna do a little getting to know you. And one of our favorites at the leadership program um, is this one, which is about music. And this gives us a sense of who's in the room, right? So the question that you can put in the chat box, your answer to, is what, are the, what is the first song or piece of music that you remember buying or owning and what format did it take? So for example, my first song was the song Safety Dance by Men Without Hats. You can dance if you want to, you can leave your friends behind. And it was in the form of a 45 record, which I imagine some of you on the call don't even know what that is. Elaine, what was your first one? Do you remember? Yes, I do remember. It was a 45, 45, and it was flash dance. <laughs> oh, what a feeling. I read Kara. It was what great. I got it for Crazy Eddie's. I, and then Jennifer was the first one in the chat box with Janet Jackson Rhythm Nation. So I am all manner of happy right now. <laughs> My 80s yeah. childhood. Who else? What do you remember? What song or album? Um, I was like, ooh, Jesse McKnight. Who's that? Oh, Jess, Jesse's in the house. That's not an answer to the question. LL, yes, on a cassette tape. Um, wacky Westerns. Oh, <laughs> Madonna. So, so far, ooh, Natalie and Bruglia. All right, so we've got some 80s and 90s coming in strong from cassette tapes to records to CD players. Ooh, the boy is mine. Oh, I love it. Now, my, my follow-up question, of course, Jay-Z was a CD. Okay, because it's interesting to me to span the generations, yes. right? Yeah. But, and so I always wonder, is there anyone on the call that just missed the opportunity to physically own music? Oh. Like, is there anyone that only has ever downloaded music that's never had a physical form? You can confess that if it's that's true about you. Alicia Keys, I love it. And even those of you that might have downloaded, there was still a, like in the early download days, you still had to pay for it, right? Through iTunes or what have you, 99 cents a song. Um, less than we old folks paid for our records and CDs. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. has anyone never ever owned music? Like had mm -hmm. to pay money for music? One cent for 12 albums. <laughs> That's like one of those old, Col not Columbia Club. What was it where you, yeah. Lick the stamp and put it on, and then you'd send it in. It was like Columbia like, House. Yes, yes, Columbia House. You get like 40 million CDs, and you wouldn't have to pay up front. Yes, yes Jenny so Knox like, here. Oh, my goodness. And BMI. and BMI. Right, right, right. So then you'd have competing. How many records can I get? I, yep. I love the young people on the call are like, I don't even know what you all are talking about. Stamp. <laughs> Hannah Montana. Gwen Stefani. Thank you so much for sharing these. Music is such a fun, um, for us anyway, connector, just to see what music speaks to us. What do we remember? Oh, LimeWire used to kill your computer, right? You illegally downloaded the songs and then get 20 viruses with it. Your <laughs> computer would die. You'd be like, hello, boss. I'm so sorry. I don't know why my computer's not working. I have no idea. I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> yes. All right, back to the important stuff. I could talk about music all day because it makes me smile, but we need to talk. We're here not to talk about music, um, but we are here to talk about emotional intelligence and why it is important for your leadership, particularly in these unprecedented times that we're living through. When I saw this meme for the first time, it made me laugh because of really just how long the last year and now change, we've passed the year mark, um, has felt for so many of us. And so while social emotional learning and emotional intelligence has always been important, um, it's never been more important than when we've most of us been in a view that looks like this um, for more than a year. So we really need to be thinking about our own approach to SEL 
um, our, our identity, our identity and intersectionalities. How am I showing up in every room that I'm in? Um, and how can I use the SEL competencies to look at my leadership? And that's what we're going to do today. So Elaine, I'll give it back to you. Yes. So now we're going to look at this roomy quote. Um, your heart is the size of an ocean. Go find yourself in its hidden depths. And I'd love to know from anyone, what does that come up for you when you see that roomy quote? Any thoughts in the chat? Your heart is as big is the size of an ocean. Go find yourself in its hidden depths. I'll just give you a second to put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. What comes up for you when you see that? Love yourself, love it. Yes, thanks, Jennifer. Listen to your heart. Yep, nice, thanks, Miss Alyssa. And Gladys says that you will always be learning from new things about yourself. Yep, <laughs> Jennifer, yes. Anything else? Any other thoughts that come up? Because of how much there is in the world to love, we have so much to learn and explore. Absolutely. Thank you. List your feelings. Yep. Um, look at the depths of being. There's so much. You have enough love for everyone to encounter. You have the ability to live beyond your limits. Yes, and Jenny loves Rumi. Yes, some of the most empower empowering poetry. The idea that your limits are your own emotionally and ooh, are your own emotionally. And it flew past because now you guys are lighting up the chat. Ooh, I know, these reflections are amazing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And they can be can expanded. Um, there are endless possibilities as long as you're willing to go find them. Absolutely, yes. There are things in the ocean that are still unknown. Yep, as well as your heart, right? Take time to go deeper within yourself, your motivations, desires, qualities, et cetera. Yes, and thank you, Vandisha. Um, Robin, acknowledge the truths on yourself, whether or not you'll, uh, others will accept them. I love that perspective. And Jenny says, conversely, here there will be monsters. <laughs> I love that. Yes. I love that Jenny said that, um, Elaine, because I was thinking, I was talking about this quote with a group um, just yesterday and a person said, I'm scared of the ocean because there's sharks and other things there. And, and I thought, what a perfect way to describe our own hearts. For many of us, it's a terrifying place to, to look deeply at. So I love that here there be monsters because there you know, it's a great unknown. That Absolutely. Space. It is a great unknown. And as some of you have said and acknowledged in the chat about being, uh, looking into your own um, emotions, right? Sometimes it's a little scary, right? And when we're talking about social emotional learning, digging deep into our emotions is this endless journey. And because we may be resistant on some level, Every layer that we go through finds a new depth of our hearts, of our emotions, of who we are. And the more we uncover these different layers and go down to different depths of our heart, the more we discover ourselves and the more we live fully, right? So I want us to kind of talk a little bit about that, just living fully and going deeper into our emotions in that place that's sometimes uncomfortable, right? We sometimes try to um, cover our emotions to protect our heart. We try to conceal how we're feeling because we want to protect ourselves. And sometimes in, in protecting ourselves, we lose out on different opportunities, so we have this chart here um, that talks about going into our comfort zone and going outside of, of our comfort zone um, and going outside of what feels safe is very scary. It's those monsters that you guys were talking about, right? So we are inviting you to kind of think broadly in going outside of your comfort zone because when we go outside the comfort zone, that's where the magic really happens. As long as we stay inside of our comfort zone, we are relegated only to what is in that zone. But there's a whole world, a whole ocean that is outside of our comfort zone. And as we look at the next um, layer outside the comfort zone is we go into the fear zone, right? Because that's the most, that's the biggest and most prominent emotion when we go outside comfort. Sometimes it shows up as anger or confusion, but it's mostly fear. And it's, this is where we're affected by others' opinions. Um, and then we have um, our self-confidence is, is lacking a little bit. And then if we go a little deeper, 
then the learning starts to happen. If we can push past that fear, then we go to that next amazing level where we can deal with challenges and problems because that is where the learning happens. We start to acquire new skills and then we can extend the comfort zone because when we get to that learning zone where we start acquiring new skills, our confidence starts to build. So our comfort zone now gets wider, it broadens. And in this point, we're also changing our brain in this point. We are, are exhibiting neuroplasticity by learning new things. We're changing our brain in order to ex expand ourselves. And then we finally go into that growth zone and not finally, but the next zone is that growth zone. And that is where we find purpose and meaning. And the thing about purpose and meaning is once we humans have food and shelter, we're kind of like at that neutral point, right? We're at the point where we're like, okay, new, food, shelter, and safety, right? That's like that Maslow's pyramid thing where food, shelter, and safety, great. From there, north of neutral is enlightenment. It is purpose. It is meaning. And when we can push past into that growth zone, we can now find fulfillment for ourselves. We can find happiness for ourselves. We're able to live our dreams. We can set new goals. And then we realize these aspirations that were once wishes, but that we're able to kind of put into action. So why are we talking about going outside our comfort zone as it relates to SEL? As Rumi kind of taught us in that, that slide right before is that when we are able to dig into our emotions, we're able to flourish in the world. We're able to broaden ourselves, broaden our skills um, and grow more. So we as adults, we can do this right? And our brains are fully developed, right? It, at this point of adulthood. But for our students who do not have brains that are fully developed, we want to pull them to that place or we want to encourage this for them. But that's kind of difficult because they're holding on to the comfort zone really tight, right? So that means we have to use um, different types of social emotional learning, i.e. transformative social emotional learning, in order to help support them through these various zones so that they can move to enlightenment and that on their own, they can find the independence to then grow from there. But as adults in the classroom, it's important that we're able to kind of sh open that door for them and provide these opportunities, just drop these opportunities in their path so that they can feel more supported when they're going into the fear zone. They can feel more supported when they're going into the learning zone and they can feel more supported when they're going into the growth zone. And soon those birdies then just fly right on and, and without us. So that's, that's what's so important about um, going from comfort to growth and how it relates to SEL. Elaine, I think my new favorite saying of yours you just said north of neutral is enlightenment. And that's about the coolest thing I've ever heard. So I'm going to now quote you on that. Um, and because I, I was thinking right before you said how our students hold on, you know, they, they're so cozy in their comfort zone. I was thinking mm -hmm. how cozy most of us adults and how stubbornly we hold on to our comfort um, because it is so comfortable um, mm -hmm. that we really have a hard time dipping our toes into that next zone. Um, we do. But when it's SEL leadership, we have to be the ones to do that first if we ever expect our students to even peek at the fear zone. Um, and which is why we're all here today and we're so happy that so many of you came today because presumably that means you're willing to you know, jump into that fear zone or at least take a look at it. Maybe not at jump least in. take a look at it. <laughs> at least look over, glance over at it from your cozy comforter. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. And it starts with us. It does start with us. And sometimes it's helpful. I know for me, um, sometimes it's helpful to think kind of think about other people before I dive into my own reflection. And so we wanted you to think about people in your life who you consider to have been or to be effective leaders. So people in your life, they can be past or present, um, but in your personal life who've been effective leaders. And just with those people in your mind, what are some of the qualities that those people possess or did possess for you while they were in your life? And just write those qualities in the chat box for us. So we can start to get a sense of 
who you identify as leaders, what were those qualities? Let's see some of those in the chat box. Compassionate, assertive, trustworthy, out of the gates. Patience, humility, authentic, supportive and effective listening, honesty, transparency, humble, real, communication ability, compassion, supportive, I'm not gonna get them all, communication, graceful, understanding, empowered, others, supportive, authentic has come up a couple times, confident, understanding, empathetic, transparent, organized. As you, if you would please, if you're not already calm, scroll, use your cursor and scroll up and down the chat and, and let these words kind of soak in. Um, and I, I'm curious what observations you have about the words that have come up for us when I asked you to think of leaders in your life. Um, so when you look at these words, scroll up and down a little bit, what do you, um, any observations about the, the collective group of words that has shown up for us right now? What do you notice? And again, you can type it in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and talk if you want to. Seems like um, it's people who um, are, have social intelligence. It seems like these are people that have social intelligence, Diana. Yes, like they, yeah. they, they either can like truly empathize with others or put um, others first, like, like true serving community, I guess. Yeah, there's a lot of servant leadership um, in that's showing up for sure. Um, communication, trustworthiness, thank you. Anyone else have any observations about the words? I agree with Diana and I think that it's like nurturing qualities more than like the actual business aspects of everybody's job. We appreciate the people that make us feel good and make us feel confident about what we're doing. So it's more all the words seem like a nurturing person. Yeah, Karen, I feel like you you just sort of ding, 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 you know, like if you were on one of those carnival prizes, you would have hit it straight to the top with that. Um, and that's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about social and emotional leadership. We talk about it sometimes as the difference between capital L leadership and lowercase l leadership. So Karen, exactly to the point that you were just making, when we think about capital L leadership, that's the title um, or position that we have. You know, I'm the vice president of, I'm the site director at, I'm the project manager of, um, that's the sort of management, boss, responsibility, status, title. That's capital L leadership, right? Um, but to your point, Karen, it's interesting that um, those kind of task um, management qualities didn't show up even one time on our list when we thought about who had an um, impact on us as an effective leader. And the truth is that for many of us, the capital L leadership comes and goes in our life. Sometimes we have those titles, those external capital L titles, and sometimes not. Um, so that's fluid. But what's always accessible and available to us is our lowercase l leadership. And Karen used the word nurturing. Um, and um, Diana used the word servant or service. And I think all of that plays into the idea of our, our lowercase l leadership is the way we show up. It's the way we show up in any situation, in any room, with any group of people, and that's what leaves an impact. And that's why that's what showed up in the chat box. All of those qualities are how that person impacted you, um, the memory that they left behind or the imprint that they left behind. Those lowercase l qualities, are, leadership qualities are available to us at any age and at any time. It's hopefully what we're teaching our students when we teach them the um, the basis of SEL, but importantly, it's what we need to remember in ourselves and our own leadership, whether it's how we're leading our students, how we're leading each other, or how we're leading our lives, um, that it's these lowercase l qualities that are the ones that matter. Um, and yes, I love, I just looked over, I glanced over at the chat box again, and the last thing um, about that at the end of the day that we're all humans and mistakes happen, there's so much beauty that happens when we approach each other human to human, isn't there? Um, and that what we're talking about, the impact people that we're remembering, I would doubt that any of them are perfect people. 
Um, and that most often what we love and remember them for are their mistakes and their victories. Their imperfections, their vulnerabilities, their flaws and their strength are all mixed up together. Um, so thank you for those. So the we have a lot of quotes for today because we love quotes. <laughs> But before I turn it back over to Elaine to really dig us back into SEL specifically, for me, when I think about that lowercase l leadership, this is always the quote that comes into my mind, which is a rock pile ceases to be a rock pile the moment a single man contemplates it, bearing within him the image of a cathedral. The rock pile ceases to be a rock pile the moment a single man contemplates it, bearing within him the image of a cathedral. Elaine, what were you going to say? No, I was just saying that I love that, you know, in that we just have these, this vision, you know, well, some of us, we have vision and we can see in a rock pile, a simple rock pile, we can see a cathedral. Yeah. I, in my end of the day before bed, mindless social media scrolling last night, there was another version of this. Um, and so I don't know who it was attributed to, but the, there was an artist sculpting and somebody said like how do you make this beautiful whatever you know this beautiful picture and the artist said i just got rid of all the extra rock it, the the beauty was already there i just got rid of the extra rock um anyone else have any reflections on this quote as relates to um how we're setting up this idea of social and emotional leadership and how we're leading and impacting those around us well, I recently subscribed to the Gaia, that streaming service, and they have like a lot of things about consciousness and also like quantum physics and things like that. And one thing they say is that like the act of observing something changes the outcome of it. So it could just be a pile of rocks, but the minute you start looking at something, it changes the perspective of it and the potential of what it could be. So if you focus more on what's happening with you inside and your um, your emotions or your thoughts, like just observing those things and being aware of your feelings and your perspectives can open your mind to new perspectives. Wow, that's amazing. I love that. The act of observing something changes it. Um, again, right on the money of the, the mere act of observing um, anything. But so for today, we're talking a lot about ourselves, right? So the mere act of observing our thoughts, our beliefs, our feelings um, changes how we interact with the world around us. Thank you for that. Anyone else have any reflections before we move on? Um, seeing th those we are leading um, not for who they are, but what they for who they could be. I love that so much. Um, the possibilities in every human. Um, the poetry unit, looking at the everyday items and then imagine what they could be is a super fun way to do that as well. Um, you know, the, I also, there was something about, um, you know, the leave everything better than you found it. That's also something that I've seen a lot lately that leaves everything better than you found it. And that includes people too. So leaving the people around us better than we found them and reimagining the possibilities. These are great. So what a great way to get us started into um, reminding ourselves or perhaps learning for the first time and either is fine, um, the, the competencies and context of SEL. So I'll turn that over to you, Lynn. Thanks, Erica. Yes, I love that. And being able to see just in something that is undefined and, and getting rid of all of the things that don't belong and just leaving what is, right? And in some sense, SEL is that, being able to look at um, what is real, what is true, what's happening with our emotions, identifying them. Um, I like that Karen mentioned in quantum physics, when you start to observe something, you can change it through the observation. And that's what's happening with our students, what's happening with us. When we start to observe our social emotional learning competencies, we're able to make change by just observing them. So we, just to talk a little bit about like what social emotional learning is, um, it's defined as the process through which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, and establish and maintain positive relationships and make responsible decisions. This is where we live. So that big L, 
at the end of the day, that big L doesn't matter. As you all saw you, you, um, in the chat, you put these little L items, which dealt with how I felt, how that person made me feel, um, how that person made me be in the world. Who we show up as in the world is more important to us than that big L title of senior director of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so um, we can get you to senior director of blah, blah, blah through that little L piece. So Castle, um, which is the organization that has kind of, um, they have uh, 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 are the authority on social emotional learning and has put out these five core competencies of social emotional learning. They, they start with um, pretty much this chart. So the, if you notice the first chart at the top, students are at the center of that chart, right? And then there's classrooms um, and then that outer circle is um, schools. And then the last circle is a societal context. So notice that that middle circle at the top is bigger and then the other circles are smaller. But what transformative SEL is, is widening, widening our lens so that all of those circles start to become closer in size because all of those circles matter as it relates to who we are as people, right? We're not one note. So how we work with one student is not the way we work with another. How we work with one adult is not the way we work with another. So we talk a lot about differentiated learning in teaching um, and how that happens with um, students in academics, but that also applies to social emotional learning that we need to be able to um, apply appropriate um, interventions um, according to who our students are. I am a Latino student from Union City, New Jersey that lives in um, a, a, a home that has maybe three people, which includes my grandmother, like who we are. I am identify as, um, as uh, this particular pronoun and I'm on the soccer team. Like I, depending on our experience, this is what shapes us, right? So we wanna be able to meet our students where they live. We wanna be able to meet them where they are as opposed to just applying this one size all um, SEL. We need to know who they are and what their experience is and be able to work with them in this particular manner, which is why each of these circles matters equally as much and not less than. So now if we look at the five um, competencies, as I was just mentioning, um, we will, um, unfortunately, my glasses are good, but they're not that good. So <laughs> go through, I'll try. We'll start with social awareness is the first competency. And it's the ability to accurately recognize um, one's own emotions through values and how they influence behavior or how am I feeling and why? So self-awareness is what's happening with me, what's happening within me. It's really connected to that Rumi quote of like, okay, my heart is an ocean. What's happening in that ocean? What's happening in that heart? And being able to accurately assess and name, identify what is going on with me, being totally self-aware. And then the next one also is- Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, Elaine, as the, as the leaders, as the adults, we are notorious for skipping one and two and going right to tending to our students. So just a reminder that self-awareness and self-management, we are the worst at doing. So as leaders to really spend time with that for ourselves is so important. Um, and the part that we're like, yeah, I don't need to spend any time on my own self-awareness. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, you know, one other caveat to that is that it, it's also not just self-awareness. Um, it, is, it, it is knowing the self, identifying parts of me and being able to articulate that. Because it's important that students can articulate what is happening with them, um, what is motivating them, what their experience is. Um, and there's a lot of data on students who are able to articulate 
their feelings, how they are able to grow more, how they are able to flourish more um, emotionally if they can articulate what their emotions are, right? And that's us as adults too. Sometimes we don't always have the words to describe how we feel and we get stuck in happy, sad, or mad, but there's just so much more that is to us. Um, and I would ask also, that would be a fun exercise, if you just started to note what are the feelings that come up for you in these different times and beyond happy, sad, or mad, how are you feeling in this moment? Um, to be able to think about that and articulate it. So the next one is self-management. And this is the ability to, successful regu to su successfully regulate one's emotions through thoughts and behaviors in different situations. Or what am I doing about how I'm feeling and is, help, is it helping or hurting? So self-management, am I gonna eat all of those cookies on the table? I want to, cause they're delicious, <laughs> these cookies. <laughs> but I know that I have to manage myself because there are consequences also. Is it helping or hurting? It's going to hurt me in the end if I eat all of those cookies, right? And that's a very small um, thing, right? Because we're talking about me. But when self-management then talks about other people, am I going to, I think it's funny to smack my, the kid in front of me on the back of his neck, but what if that really hurts him? And then everybody gets in trouble, right? Because, you know, when we're talking about middle school students, um, you know, for those of us who have middle school, the kids love to smack each other on the back of the neck or just smack each other in general. But well, what's the consequence of on that? So being able to, um, to identify, um, self-management within themselves, be able to self-manage them, them, themselves and then identify, is this going to hurt or help, right? In, in this particular situation. Social awareness, the ability to take the perspective of and empathize with others. We're gonna talk a lot about empathy coming in the next few slides, including those from diverse backgrounds and cultures or how are you feeling and why? caring about others. And so look at your own caring, look at your own empathy. Because sometimes we tend to think empathy in that, oh, I have empathy because I care about this particular cause. But do you care about the cause of this person over here who's not in your social group or who's not in your, your tribe, right? Where is your empathy? <clears throat> so having social awareness, um, is important to be able to see, okay, what's happening around me? Um, and it's not just me. Relationship skills. So that's the ability to establish and maintain a healthy and rewarding relationship with diverse individuals and groups, or what am I doing about how you're feeling? And is it helping or hurting? Again, are we helping situations or are we hurting? Now this relationship skills piece, I would argue, is everything. It's everything. Building healthy relationships determines whether I can get a good job or not, whether I'm going to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend or not, right? Or a relationship, whether I'm going to maintain a harmonious relationship with my friends, a harmonious relationship with my parents or all of the people in my life. So if my relationship skills are built up and developed well, I will do well in the world, right? So the relationship skills thing is another thing I think we gloss over too often and um, just don't realize the importance of building these relationship skills it means building absolutely everything. So how do we do that? And how do we provide these opportunities for our students to build better and healthier relationships? And then for us, how are we building relationships with other people? And what does that look like? Because as educators, you wanna be able to identify what that looks like. In this moment, I'm actively building relationship skills, knowing that that's happening so that you can be conscious of how we're providing these opportunities for folks around us. And then finally, responsible decision-making. 
The ability to make constructive choices about personal behavior and social interactions based on ethical standards, safety concerns, and social norms, or what decisions are we making that are moving our relationship or company or community or world forward in a positive and productive direction? And what decisions are sending us backwards? So to be able to identify how we are making decisions and how those decisions are affecting others, um, how am I moving myself forward or the people around me? And how are these decisions moving us back? Because every day, someone else put it in the chat that when you are, you want to work with someone who can understand that mistakes are gonna happen and that they're not gonna fly off the handle when it happens, right? But it's important that we are upfront and acknowledge when our decision-making is not moving us forward because that is how we learn. So I just want to also just speak to some of the things that are in the chat, which are great. Um, so a person who can recognize at the end of the day that we're, okay, Robin, seeing all those uh, we are leading not from for who they are, but for who they could be. Sorry, I think that I went back a little too we far. Went back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I oh, highlighted that we'll be sending, I'll just, I was highlighting that we'll be sending it because this is so, there's so much great stuff in what you just said, Elaine, that I didn't want people to start to suddenly panic and scramble. Because right. I don't know about you, but when I look at these, um, you know, these are the same competencies that many of us have been looking at with the SEL circle for years. Um, and we, but we look at them historically for what, what activities am I doing? What posters am I hanging in my classroom? But when the way, when I listen to you talk about these and I think about them specific to my own leadership, like if I've turned that lens just back on me, it really lands in a different way um, in terms of the impact that I have on those around me. Um, and that my, the more I am aware um, of my impacts, the greater my potential impact can be. So I love, I love you describing them because also it's a reminder that, um, so when we talk about SEL, most of us are used to hearing SEL. We're in education. We're usually used to the way Elaine started looking at the way the castle circle used to be predominantly and historically that was skills that we teach our students in the classroom and then the rest was sort of secondary and castle blessedly has really widened the lens for all of us to be thinking about it for ourselves however the work of sel for adults is not new it just usually goes by a slightly different name which is emotional intelligence so for whatever reason those two domains have been spoken of separately and i just wanted we wanted to bring this together to remind us um, or highlight for us that the skills are one and the same. So when you look here, this slide here is Daniel Goleman, who's the granddaddy of emotional intelligence. The domains for emotional intelligence are exactly the same as the domains for SEL. They oftentimes leave out the responsible decision-making as its own separate entity. But the idea of going from self-awareness to self-management to relationship skills, um, like through social awareness, is exactly the same work of emotional intelligence. And if you remember our beginning quote from the Center for Creative Leadership, that 75% of all of our careers are derailed, not for those technical skills, but for this stuff, the emotional competencies or our emotional intelligence. So why we understand that we need to start teaching our students that in pre-K and in preschool we need to also remember that we need to keep working on that for the entirety of our careers and our lives so that call it SEL, call it emotional intelligence, call it EQ, give it any name you want. It's the same skills and they're important for our lifetime. So when we talk about, so we then squish the concepts together and talk about them fluidly to remind ourselves that that work is never done. Um, and the moment we think as educators or adults that we're done with it, we've probably, there's work that we need to do on it, right? So Joshua Friedman is a professor out in California who, just to frame the definition, to take what Elaine said and then give it that wider context of emotional intelligence, that emotional intelligence is a way of recognizing, understanding, and choosing how we think, feel, and act. It shapes our interactions with others and our understanding of ourselves and defines how and what we learn. It allows us to set priorities and determines the majority of our daily actions. Joshua Friedman says, 
So conversely to the 75% of careers that get derailed, he says 80% of our success is determined by our emotional intelligence. And Daniel Goleman himself reminds us that if our emotional abilities aren't in hand, if we don't have self-awareness, which is a, what we're about to dive into more deeply, um, and empathy like Elaine was talking about, if we're not able to manage our distressing emotions, then no matter how smart we are, we are not going to get very far. So just a pause for a minute to ask you, when you look at these competencies of self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making, how do you rate yourself? How do you feel like you're doing for yourself, not what you're doing for your students, but turning the lens on your own leadership, how are you in these categories? What are the ones that you're like, got it, acing it, perfect at it, teaching the president about it, versus which are the ones that you're like, I, I, I'd never look at this, I don't wanna talk about it. I think I have another meeting to get to. So where are you on the spectrum? Um, let us know, give us, some, give us some thoughts. And Erica, maybe if you can turn back to the slide that has the yes. competencies so that people can see them. In the chat box, or you can unmute yourself if you just want to kind of think out loud. We just are curious. Jennifer, I love that you're the one out of the gates because I think for most of us, that's exactly the truth is that we invest to our, and that's why I said when Elaine was going through these, I said most of us skip straight to number three and move happily onward. We invest a lot of time and energy and love to our students and our staff, and that's why we're really good at our jobs but we forget the importance in leadership of spending time on one and two. Um, yeah, look at that. That's, that's the first two that's come up. It's not unusual that our self-awareness and self-management are the least tended to. Anyone and else? Relationship skills. Oh, sorry. The relationship skills. I love, and Elaine, as Elaine pointed out, it's really where the magic happens but we can't get to the effective relationships until we've done the work of self-awareness and self-management. Elusive, what a great word. Self, you know, the, the nuance of self-awareness to self-management is a subtle one. Um, so I think we can be aware, but then what do we do about that awareness? That's a good reflection to think about that. Right, and that's just it. That's why it's so important to answer this question for yourself. Because if you are not quite sure where you are, you're not quite sure where you need to go. So <laughs> it's one of those things that we don't always want to look at, right? It's it, Remember back to that comfort zone, um, from the comfort zone to the growth zone? It's kind of hard to go out of our comfort zone and say, this is where I need to do work. Um, but it is important that we do that because we are able to support ourselves and then the people around us. Because most of us, um, well, you know what, Robin, I don't think any of it can be perfected. I love that you just said that because um, social awareness, not, none of, in my opinion, none of this can be perfected because it, we're dealing with, we are humans dealing with other humans and every day is different. Every situation is different. And so exactly the question that you ask is not like, Am I great at it? It can be, am I feeling good about it right now? Um, but are you doing the work every day is exactly right. You hit it right on the nose. Um, putting other people's needs before myself is again, not to generalize, but those of us that are in service, right? Um, this, is a, this is a common theme of I skip straight to tending to those around me, feels like taking care of myself is selfish, feels somehow wrong. But what we have to understand when we're talking about SEL, and especially when we're talking about understanding that self-awareness and self-management, how am I feeling and why, brings me to this quote, which I always use because it always makes me think twice um, on why this matters, why those first two that most of us skip over, self-awareness and self-management, matter so much. Douglas Kanant, who's a former CEO of Campbell's Soup, he, once he retired, he created a leadership institute during one of his talks on leadership said this, even a brief interaction can change the way people think about themselves, their leaders, and the future. Each of those many connections you make has the potential to become a high point or a low point in someone's day. What he's saying here is that you, in you, individual you, with every single interaction, 
could potentially make or break somebody's day. You, with your simple text, email, phone call, the way you're looking at me right now, are either gonna send my day spiraling into a terrible, terrible day or make it better than it was before. That's how much potential impact we have in every interaction. And I always think about that when I think about like just looking in the eye of a stranger who's looking like looking, truly looking at me and I'm having a particular kind of day and tears instantly come to my eyes. That's that kind of connection, you know, versus a coworker who says something snarky that they think is funny that then I hold on to for 12 years after that. Every interaction really has that much potential power. So when we think about our self-awareness and our self-management, we have to understand that that's how much impact we have on those around us. So if we're not paying attention to what's going on inside of us, there's no way we can control what's spewing out of us. Because that ocean that's inside of us is coming out, whether we're conscious of it or not. So the more we're working on our self-awareness and self-management, the more we can control whether we're making somebody's day better or worse. And that exact point, you don't know what somebody is struggling with. And I love that you said it that way too, because what you didn't say is you don't know if somebody's struggling. What you said is you don't know what they're struggling with, because the truth is we are all struggling. Some days the struggle is almost unbearable. And some days it's just a minor nuisance, but there's a struggle going on in every day. And we don't know the struggles. And so that compassion and kindness, um, everything that we do can make an impact. I mean, that's the scary news of the conversation of SEL leadership and the good news is that everything we do has the potential to make an impact. And the more we're aware, the more we can decide whether that impact hurts or helps, right? And we're going to get to empathy in a minute, which is a lot of where this lives. But I just want to, before I turn it back over to Elaine to really dig into this self-awareness, usually when we have this topic, there's, there's always some skeptics that hold out on this idea that how important can the soft skills really be? Like, isn't it really important that capital L leadership technical skills? So I love Google's Project Oxygen just as a good example of really to drive the point home. Some of you may have heard of Project Oxygen, but Google is known for starting their company as a company built for engineers by engineers, and all we care about is hiring engineers. So when Google first started, they made it known that they were looking for Ivy League graduates, top of the class, engineers. They didn't care a lick about your personal skills. They wanted your technical skills. They even in like 2002 tried this experiment of flattening the organizational chart so they didn't want to have traditional management leadership hierarchy. They wanted to leave the engineers alone to do their work, put them in teams based on the projects they were working on, give a project management you know, title to the top engineer on the team and let it sort itself out. What they quickly realized was things were not sorting themselves out. Some teams were imploding while other teams were thriving. So when they started to say, you know, we should probably look at why some this is happening, um, that's what Project Oxygen was, an internal deep dive of data-driven inquiry to figure out why some of their teams were thriving. And what they realized with the teams that were thriving was that person that they gave that capital L leadership title to was becoming a really good lowercase l leader. So in 2009, the first list of, they had eight at that time, it was top eight behaviors of best managers from Google. You see here 10, because in 2019, they revised the list. So meaning from like 2006 onward, Google has consistently proven to itself that their best teams are led by leaders who thrive in that lowercase l skill set. The technical skills, which are now number eight on their 10, the first go round was dead last. So what they thought to be true originally was the technical skills are most important, the rest will work itself out. They flipped that on its head when they looked at it in real life application. The soft skills, I say very loosely, turn out to be the most important thing time and time again. So Elaine. Yes, so absolutely. And when we look at that list, we see some of these skills that we all have within us. And it's unfortunate in that sometimes we have those skills, we expect everybody else to have those skills, right? Which is where those, um, the, the uh, uh, uppercase L 
leaders at Google got in trouble with so many years ago. They thought that if they had those skills, everybody must have those skills, right? But it's not necessarily the case. It's something that we have to work at constantly. And because what we water grows in watering our own skills and watering our own talents, this is what makes us better. This is what um, helps us to grow as far as um, in, in, in these particular skills. We have to practice them because remember, we're outside of our comfort zone now in some of these areas. And as you guys have mentioned, some of you in the chat, you're like, I do great at this, but these things I don't do so well at. And also there are some things that we're never gonna be perfect at, right? But we want to continue to practice and we want to continue to try. So I want us to all look at what are we watering? And of course we need to start with ourselves and what we're watering so that we can flourish and so that we can grow. Just as we're watering those plants, what are we doing for ourselves as far as, um, as, as flourishing with those, those skills? So um, we don't see the world as it is. We see it as we are, okay? We love to kind of think that in a sense, like the world is this, but we don't see that. There's this interesting story. I don't know if it's really true, but they say <laughs> when, um, back when Columbus first came to the United States or, or America, whatever that land mass was, the Native Americans were on, some of the Native Americans were on the shore and the ships were coming in and they did not see those ships. And the reason why they say they didn't see these ships is because they had never seen anything like this. They ne never imagined that this would be the case because they're seeing the world as through their, well, on what they know. So it's not till the ships are there and people are in front of them and they're like, wait a minute, how'd you get there? I don't know if that story is true, but I'll tell you what story really is true. We did not know that the sky was blue till about maybe, I would think they say like about 10,000 years ago because we had not understood the concept of the color blue. This is actually true. So we are seeing the world as we, what we think it is. And that is in every interaction. And for our social workers that are on the line, we kind of know that to be true, right? And that we see through our own experience and not necessarily what is. So with that, it's important to be able to have kind of like another filter or another outside lens to say, okay, I know I'm seeing it through my own, um, my own eyes. Now, that because that's the story that I'm telling myself, now what is true here? And to have another investigative I and another thought in this to say, okay, well, what's real and what is really happening? So it's just important to kind of have that awareness as we're talking about self-awareness, like what is actually true in this? And uh, which kind of brings us to the next thing um, in being able to see things that are true. I'd love to talk a little bit about growth mindset. If you've heard of growth mindset, could you please put that in the chat? Just say yes. Yes, you've heard of growth mindset, okay? Or no, you've never heard of it. Just kind of getting an idea. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, so growth mindset is a concept that was developed by psychologist Carol Dweck, um, who thought um, growth, some people have a growth mindset and some people have a fixed mindset. Now, this happens at different times, right? Growth mindset happens um, with us every day and a fixed mindset happens with us every day. And if you can go to the next so slide, what she talks about as far as growth mindset is concerned is it's the understanding that abilities and the understanding can be developed, okay? So that, that abilities and understanding can be developed. Those with a growth mindset believe they can get smarter, more intelligent and more talented through putting in time and effort. So this is important that if I have a growth mindset, I know I can develop my abilities if I put effort into trying, okay? And also in putting effort into trying, when we try, has anybody ever um, played a video game before? 
put it in the chat. Yes, you played a video game. Put it in the video game that you play. Okay, what video game do you play? Okay, and the first time you'd ever you've ever played, okay, God of War, Pac-Man, perfect. The first time you've ever played Among Us you kind of died quickly, right? Your character died <laughs> quickly, <laughs> right? I feel like that's the concept of all of these video games. When you try that first time or you tried with Pokemon Go, you didn't get very far in the game because it was your first time trying. You had an expectation of moving forward, but something in you knew that you were gonna move but so far in the game because you are a novice at that game. The growth mindset says, I know that there will be obstacles. I'm going to try to play this video game. I'm going to try to attempt whatever it is that I'm attempting. And I may fail at that first attempt. And I understand that that has happened. But I have to try again through that failing. There's data and there's information so that I can grow from that. And if you can go to the next slide, I'd love to show you guys this map which is called um, the learner and the judger path. And it was um, created by Marley Adams to kind of show what a growth mindset can do for us and what a fixed mindset can do for us. And so when we're starting off the path, something happens, something comes up, like in, let's just say the video game, we get to a place of an impasse at the video game that we can't get past that first level or that fourth level, whatever that is, right? And we have a choice here. The learner mindset, or if we're on the learner path, we can look at what has happened, right? Or what's gone, what are the facts in this particular situation? And then I can make a choice to go further. But sometimes what can happen is we get to that first level and we fail and we start to judge ourselves. And you'll see if you go down and you start saying, whose fault is this? I'm so stupid. What's wrong with me? This game is impossible. This is not for me. There are other people who are doing great at that game. They must just be born with those abilities. The fixed mindset believes other people are just born with those abilities. So that's just for them, they can do those things. This is ridiculous. I'm going to get give up. And then you continue to spiral down. I am stupid. I'm a failure. I'm always bad at these things, i.e. video games, i.e. skiing or whatever that thing is. And I say that because I had a, a fixed mindset about skiing because I'm great at sports. I got to tell you, well, I used to be great at sports. And then I went skiing for the first time and I'm like, I'm gonna ace this because I know how to skateboard. I know how to do all these things. This is great. And I bombed. I bombed at skiing and I, the, I'm going down the mountain and then I fall backwards and I'm just laying down and a five-year-old kid comes and skis up next to me and says, ha, 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 you can't ski. The kid is five. <laughs> I take that to heart. I'm like, oh my God, I'm terrible. <laughs> and then my judger mindset comes into play. However, and then I, I said, I'm just not good at this. That kid is just built for this. However, I could have had a choice. I could say, okay, what's happening now? Let me go and take a ski lesson. Let me think about what can happen from here. What assumptions am I making? I'm just saying I'm a bad person or I'm a bad skier just because I can't, you know, ski. Um, but in fact, what I can do is I can make a choice to say, I'm going to try harder, okay? The growth mindset wants to learn more, wants to try harder and through effort can try harder. But then that um, the fixed mindset is, will just spiral out and say, this thing is not for me. So I just wanted to kind of show you guys this map just to kind of show like where we are with our emotions. Sometimes we kind of take a few steps forward in digging into this concept of uh, emotional intelligence. And we say, this is too much for me and I need to tap out of it. But it's important to know that if we approach this with a growth mindset, we can learn so much more. 
as opposed to the fixed mindset, which keeps us at the same place or the same level. Else I love about this, Elaine, I love it so much because if you even take it to the next level, when we talk about the self-awareness and self-management step that so many of us confess to skipping or avoiding, um, is that when we start to increase our awareness, this is something that we can become aware of is observing which thoughts naturally occur to us. Are they the judger thoughts or the learner thoughts? Which are the first occurring? You know, you often talk about our negative biases. Um, and it's only through increasing our awareness of these things that we can make choices, different choices, um, and really flex those growth muscles. So I love this as a tool um, for our own self-awareness work of just observing with curiosity, which path do we default to? Um, because when we start to notice that, then we can start to make changes when, when necessary. Um, Elaine, you're not alone in the uh, skiing. Vandesha also had a five-year-old laugh in their face. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> so our self-worth is on the skiing mountain. We're not going to have time, spend any time on this because I'm looking at the clock and we have so much left that we want to get to. So I'm going to move away from this almost immediately. But I want to tell you that um, we, this is a great um, sort of journal exercise for self-reflection. When we're talking about awareness, some of you, if you know it, um, you can probably agree that this is a great way to look at how we're showing up. Um, it's called the Joe Harry window. If you don't know it and you just are curious about journaling, self-reflection, self-awareness activities, take a screenshot of it now. And you'll also get this presentation later. And then send me an email later. I have just put my email in the chat box and say, Erica, talk me through this Joe Harry window. What the heck am I supposed to do with it? Um, because we are not going to spend time with it, but it is a wonderful way to look at how you're showing up in the world. All right, we're, we're in our final 23 minutes, but we want you, you've been staring, well, I presume you've been staring at least partially at us. <laughs> we need you to pause and stretch and turn your eyes away from a screen. So whether you've been looking at us or your phone or another screen, I need you to look your eyes out a window if you have one, just away from any screen, stretch your body if you need to, stand up if you need to, just give yourself a pause away from us, count to 20 in your mind. All right, that was my 20. Monica, you're on the beach. I'm just looking at Monica's screen and I, that just takes me on vacation. Some virtual backgrounds are the best for that. Um, but we, Elaine wants, we have so much to talk about in terms of we've talked about self-awareness, um, but we can't leave the conversation of our lowercase l leadership if we don't expand that view to once we increase our own self-awareness, um, really expanding that view out to others and social awareness. So I'm going to give it right back to Elaine for that. Um, and of course, we have another guiding quote for this section. <laughs> Okie doke. I'm going to run through the quote and run through this because I want to make sure that we get through everything. Um, but the quote here by um, Henry David Thoreau is, could a great miracle take place then for us to look through each other's eyes for an instant? Could a greater miracle take place so we're, we want to look at empathy, right? Because we, we talked a little bit about it and we danced a little bit about, around empathy. And as I was mentioning before, sometimes we tend to believe that we are quite empathetic in a particular area. And if we look a little deeper, that is the area that we're empathetic as opposed to like kind of like a broader lens of empathy. And if you can um, put, put the graphic up, just um, advance it one more. Um, so when we talk about like their perspective, uh, to take their perspective of empathy, like you're taking someone else's perspective of empathy, that's one type of empathy, considering emotion, um, and then withholding judgment, right? So we want our empathy to intersect in all of these three places, right? And if you can move on, because we're really going to dig into it here. Um, and so these are the three types of empathy, right? This perspective taking piece is like, what am I thinking of? Or what, what, what do I think of this particular situation, scenario? Um, and 
that's where a lot of our empathy kind of lives, honestly. Like, um, I believe in this cause. I believe in this particular thing. And I'm kind of taking this on and I care about this perspective, right? And then there's that feeling piece, the emotional piece. Um, we know that we're digging a little bit deeper when we now have this feeling uh, um, piece and empathy. That's where our mirror neurons come into play. So we see someone crying and I don't know if this has ever happened to you and it's someone that we really are kind of dear to. And then we then become emotional and want to cry or actually do cry, right? So that we are now, um, our brain is identifying with what this person is going through. And we have now become one with them in this experience in crying. Um, and that is with a lot of different situations, right? That feeling piece. And that's the piece that we kind of like resonate with. And that's where we kick our empathy up a bit, another notch where we've gone from just our perspective of, okay, I, I think this makes sense, or I, I kind of identify with this piece, but it's embedded in us when our mirror neurons kick in and we start to mirror others that we really, we feel what they are going through. And then if we go to that next piece is that compassionate empathy and where our uh, uh, action takes place. So we've gone from feeling, we've gone from perspective thinking about it, feeling it, right? And then maybe even show, we, we can tell that we felt it because we will have that emotion. But then now we're having actions toward it. Now we are, are active in our empathy. We are showing our empathy because we are, have been activated. Now I'm going to put my arm around you. Now I'm going to actually talk to you because I see that you're hurting. This is just an example um, that you're crying. I empathize with you. I understand wh where you are coming from. I'm there with you. I'm in the trenches with you now because I am now taking an active role to show you compassion, to show you that I care about what you care about, which is very important when it comes to, down to kids or anybody really. We really want to know that you care about what I, that I, you care about what I care about. You don't have to like what I care about, but you just need to care about what's going on with me. So as we see that perspective, empathy, empathetic concern is really that perspective taking plus the emotions catching and plus the action. All of those things are, that's that comprehensive empathy that we wanna be paying attention to. And I wanna give you guys the homework to think about where does your empathy lie? What does your empathy really look like? And are you exhibiting these three parts of empathy? And now you're not gonna be in tears with every single interaction, right? But you're going to note the feeling that comes up. So when you have the perspective of you're seeing a situation, where is, is your, and only because I'm looking at the cliffs right now and there's usually like deer that are in there, but I see a deer that falls down the side of the cliff. I notice the deer, I feel bad for the deer. I might even feel it in my heart, like, oh my goodness. And then I finally leave my house or I make a phone call to animal safety to say, hey, there's a deer with a broken leg. Um, you should kind of tend to that. Now that's, you know, small potatoes compared to what we deal with on the daily, right? But where does that empathy lie? And I'd love for you guys to kind of look at just your homework. Where are you being empathetic? And where are you in that cycle? So just notice where are you in that empathetic cycle? And Artie says, empathy goes a long way. It does, because if I know that you are empathetic about me, then I'm more inclined to build a little more trust, right? And then we have listening empathy. So as we talk about empathy, um, as far as like, do how do we know we're being empathetic? Um, this quote here by Brene Brown, who I love, empathy is a strange and powerful thing. There is no script. There's no right way or wrong way to do it. It's simply listening, holding space, withholding judgment, emotionally connecting and communicating that incredibly healing message of you are not alone. 
just being there and just listening is the best empathy, the best e exhibition of empathy that you can have holding space and just being there. Renee, she's Renee for president. I tell you what, um, the idea of listening, I love that she has brought to the attention this idea that listening um, is an empathetic skill because empathy, like so much of our social and emotional leadership can feel so slippery and intangible. Like I get the concept, but what am I actually supposed to do to improve my skills other than just say, yeah, that makes sense. And active listening um, is such a thing that we all understand it, but to make the connection that active listening is a display of empathy, I think is such a great um, and critical point. Because when we talk about um, our social emotional leadership, Daniel Goleman says that empathy is the most important leadership skill there is. You know, Elaine talked about how relationship skills are the most important. And so to just emphasize that, that within that relationship skill building, the best bridge for us is empathy. And one of the best ways to build that bridge and maintain that bridge is through active listening. So like Elaine said, what gets in our way, um, you know, that triangle of empathy um, is judgment. One of those three um, things that she talked about um, was withholding our judgment. And um, yes, yes, I just checked over in the chat box. Um, it's amazing how much people open up when you just stop talking and listen um, and actually listen. And we know what we mean, like actually listening versus just saying, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. <laughs> um, but actually stopping and listening. Um, and that we hear that so often from our students. And honestly, we feel it so much in ourselves. No one listens to me. No one cares. Um, you know, the, the, um, we talk a lot in leadership about leading with love. And um, that love means that we feel, to feel loved means to feel seen and heard and valued. Um, and so when we're talking about empathy as a leadership skill, what we're displaying is love. What we're saying is, I hear you, I see you, and I value you. Um, and yeah, stopping and listening. If we take nothing away from today, paying attention for the rest of our day, how much we're stopping to listen to our coworkers, then we're making progress. So with one way that we can be in empathy is through withholding judgment. You can't be in judgment and in empathy at the same time. Those two things cannot coexist. Because if I'm placing judgment on you, I'm not empathetic to you. So one thing that gets in our way, and it may not feel like we're judging, but we are, is when we make assumptions. So how do I know if I'm making assumptions about a situation? Well, some of these phrases might be coming into your mind. Elaine, you must be feeling X, Y, or Z. Or, oh, I would totally do that differently. I can't believe you did that. Always, never, why are you making such a big deal out of this? Any of these things, if these phrases or versions of them crop in your head, that means you're making an assumption about how the other person should be feeling, thinking, acting, believing, and that's judgment. And if you're feeling those things, you're not feeling in empathy, which means you're stuck. Your social awareness, your social leader, social emotional leadership work is, is stuck, right? So one active way to get ourselves out of judgment is to replace our assumptions with curiosity. I want to be in wondering instead of in assuming. So some practice words, if you looked at that previous slide and said, oh, crud, <laughs> I find myself saying or thinking those things quite a lot more than I would like to admit, then simply take note of the curiosity phrases on this slide. Help me understand. Elaine, I'm not familiar with that term you just used. Can you explain it more? Or I don't see it that way. I'd like to understand your perspective and maybe share mine. How can I best support you right now? These are, this curiosity is, is empathy as well. So replacing our assumptions with curiosity um, is a really important empath empathy skill, but it's a really important bridge between the, the first two self-awareness and self-management to the second two, social awareness and relationship skill building. You have to, you have to do the work of empathy to, to make the bridge between those. Any thoughts on these? The idea of empathy as a leadership skill, and then this idea of replacing our assumptions and our judgment with curiosity. Anyone have any thoughts or observations?
the same, yeah, the saying does goes, right? The word ass is in the word assume for a reason, many people say. <laughs> so let's stop trying to assume. Or this one, I just, this, this is the quote I use to kick my own butt, right? To remind myself that if I think I'm leading and I turn around and nobody's following, I'm just taking a walk. If I'm only focusing on my capital L leadership title and the work of the capital L leader, then I'm not actually doing the work of leading or leadership. Um, true leadership means I'm I'm in the community um, and I'm walking side by side. And the best way that I can build and be in the community is through these empathetic skills that we're talking about. So Elaine's going to take us all the way back to the beginning as we come to the ending. Yes. So, right. So just really quick, we're going to just look at the self-awareness piece, right? We talked about like if we're self-aware, how am I feeling and why, right? If I'm practicing self-awareness, how am I feeling and why? And then if I'm looking at self-management, I'm thinking, what am I doing about how I'm feeling? And is this helping or hurting, right? So what am I doing? Self-management is like, um, how am I managing myself? And is what I'm doing helping or hurting within what I'm doing myself? How am I affecting other people. And then social awareness is everything outside of me, right? Um, where, how am I socially aware of what else is going on and how is, is that affecting me? So how are you feeling and, and why? I'm caring about how you're feeling, right? And if I'm being socially aware, how are you feeling and why? And then if we're talking about relationship skills, um, what am I doing about how you're feeling and is it helping or hurting? So I'm building relationships with other people around me. And how do my empathy, this is where my empathy is really shining, is that helping or hurting and how I'm feeling about uh, um, you or the folks around me? Um, and then what am I doing about your feelings, right? Just as Erica was mentioning. And then responsible decision-making. What decisions am I making? Are they working in my benefit? Are they working in the benefit of the people around me in my community, in my school? But my res responsible decision-making lies within how my decision-making affects me and those around me, really quick. So as we, we're you know, almost at the end, but things that I just would love for us to all think about is what's one social emotional competency you're thinking about differently since the beginning of this? What's something that came up for you? Um, one of the competencies that came up for you that you might be thinking about differently. I'd love for you to put that in the chat. And also think about where do you need help? We tend to believe that we have to do all these things on our own, but how can we get help? from someone else, right? And then what are the cool ideas do you have around this? Like, how can you foster this within yourself or foster these competencies within the others that are around you, okay? I'd love for you any of those ideas to throw in the chat. And how is your team doing with these skills? So we know we, we kind of talked about it a little bit about how we're doing, but like, what does that look like as our team? Any one of these, if you can throw that in the, in the chat, that would be great. So um, Jennifer, yes. Um, do you, and I'm imagining you're saying yes to if you need uh, uh, help or um, any of, not being afraid to ask for help. Yes, absolutely. It's important that we look for help where we can find it. And I think and that so many of us, because we skip the same way that we skip self-awareness and self-management and focus on others, we also, for some reason, also then don't ask for help or feel like we have to do it all on our own. So I love that those are the first ones that are showing up. Right. And then Jenny says team skills. Um, I have an interesting challenge with my team. I work with a group that can have a concerning view of empathy and its application. It's been a long process with a lot of repetition and return to basics. Yep, because this is a process. Mm -hmm. Curious about the concerning view of empathy. Um, you know, that's probably a conversation that would take us through two more hours, but I, I'm curious about it because I think it is, it's really um, true for a lot of us that in, in our organizations, there's different perspectives about the importance of empathy. 
and its role in the workplace, like all of this SEL work. Um, and so to be somebody that's really championing, championing, how do you say that word? Championing um, SEL leadership can put you in the center of very diverse opinions about it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And yes, and Vandisha says she, it's not just with the kids, right? It's as we get older, which is why we're saying start with you first and then fan out um, to others. But by looking at our own empathy, right, starting with us helps us to look at where it lies in others. And it's never, and it's, you know, it's, to me, I always say it's the good news and bad news that we're never done with this. You'll never get to check this off the list. <laughs> and the moment you say, I am so good at this is probably when you're the least aware of how not good you are doing, right? <laughs> yes, yes. The different learning styles too. Um, I, oh, that's so fantastic. Did you see that, Elaine? I love that the being open to the various learning styles because it's so true that it's so different how we all receive information. Yep, that's that transformative SEL, being understanding of the different ways that we learn. Um, as we're winding down, um, Danny is gonna put an evaluation link. Um, I wanna say this now, cause I'll forget, we'll forget to say it as, we're, as you're leaving. Um, mm -hmm. So make sure you fill out the evaluation before you log off. She just put it in the chat box. Mm -hmm. We also have, you're going to get the presentation later. So we recognize that there's no way you could possibly see all these articles. But this topic, as you can tell, even from this hour and a half is so rich. These are a bunch of articles on SEL and emotional intelligence and the importance of emotional intelligence in the workplace that we love from a whole number of different places. So you can look at those later. We have our starter reading list of books that we love on this topic. Um, because the work is never done, we should continually treat ourselves as students of this work, whether it's articles, books, or trainings like this. Um, so if there's any final reflections on the workshop in general, we'd love for you to put it in the chat box now. Anything that's on your mind, um, kind of that moment that Elaine said at the very beginning, if you write it down, you have a better chance of remembering it. I, I like to call it a brain picture. Like, what do I want to hold on to? If you say it out loud to us now or put it in the chat box, it also helps us hold on to it as well. So any final reflections in the chat box, we'd love to hear it. Um, there's so, thank you for the very informative, Artie. Um, it's so, there's so much in this topic, right? This topic itself is like an ocean, just like the Rumi quote, our heart's the size of an ocean, but the topic of SEL is as well. Right. And we're just getting started. So um, oh. we're, we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into the guiding questions to transform our SEL approach, as you see here um, on April 20th, where we'll, we'll be able to dig a little deeper into that transformative SEL piece. And what are some questions we can ask that really kind of help guide us because this is amorphous, right? So we understand the concepts and we understand, all right, yeah, social emotional learning, it's good. But how do I really apply that specifically? So for some of us who are having difficulty, we're gonna talk about the questions that we're, we're, we can use and that you can use in, in being able to transform your classroom to an SEL uh, transformative classroom. And then the part three option, there should be a link, but Danny, I'm gonna, if you have the answer to that question, the part three um, is about then creating classroom spaces and communities that are transformative. So part two, like is on the screen here, is the, tr the guiding questions that help inform your thinking. And then part three is really setting up classroom spaces. Um, so Jenny, I see your question and Danny, maybe in the follow-up email or do we have the link for part three that we could give them now? Yeah. I know, let me double check. Um, I can share the information. Hold on, I have it here. Again, to say at each one of these is designed, we design them so they'll stand alone. So if you're only able to come to this one, hopefully you got some value from it. If you only come on Tuesday, you'll get value, but certainly they build. Um, so the three pack is really meant to transform your thinking um, in the field. So Danny's so looking. It's possible that maybe in the title, it doesn't say part three, but it is the title of the workshop is supporting students with special needs tips for 21st century programming, I think. Um, no, that's, that's not our that's part three. Other. We have so, there's so yeah, much, there's so many. the menu of workshops is so fantastic this year. Um, 
So perhaps, um, Danny, in the follow-up email, do they get the menu of choices in general? Um, I think so, because I'm not the one who sends the email. I know it's the folks at the DOE who sends like the whole catalog, but the date of that workshop is on is Thursday, April 29th, 10 to 11.30. So maybe part three. missing the part three in the title, but it is on April 29th. So anyone that's, um, we're so sorry that this is the clunky part, right? The logistics. I just put my email again in the chat box, Erica at TLPMYC. If you are looking at your menu and struggling to figure out which ones, please just email me and I'll sort it out with you. Um, and because we know we have to go, but we will sort it out because we'd love to see you um, for all of them, honestly. So that's it. We know you have to go, 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 go to your days. Um, the Elaine and I would love to keep talking to you. So we put our emails and our LinkedIn profiles here. Um, stay in touch. Elaine and our colleague Stephanie will see you on Tuesday for the guiding questions um, part two. Uh, and we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks so Absolutely. much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks.